Today's program would not have been possible had Gaetan Verna, director of the power plant, not planted a seed about this film in my brain about a year or probably more ago. But of course, as a programmer, you sort of seek the right time and the right place. And when this year's to, uh, Toronto Design Offsite Festival came around, I just thought, this is really the perfect time. Um, because the power plant otherwise doesn't really have a forum to talk about things like architecture and design. So I extend our sincere thanks to Deborah and Leanne and their colleagues at the festival. Uh, the power plant could not offer our programming without the generous support of our sponsors. So I extend thanks to our primary education sponsor, CIBC, as well as our institutional sponsors, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, and the Toronto Arts Council. And additionally, some of you may know that the power plant offers year-round free admission, thanks to BMO. Of course, we hope to see you uh, this coming Friday when we open our winter 2018 exhibition season, during which two new exhibitions will open. The Field of Emotion, Kader Atia's exploration of repair of both the physical and the psychological, and The Song of the Germans, Emeka Ogbo's sound installation, which debuted at the Venice Biennale in 2015, about immigrants, belonging, nationalism, and more. And the power plant will continue its Clear Story Commission from fall 2017, entitled Demonstration by Michael Landy. But turning to today's program, we'll screen the film Integral Man, and then we ask you to stick around for a lively discussion by an esteemed panel, which of course will include some questions from you, our audience. Our moderator today is George Baird, former Dean of University of Toronto's John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design, and a partner in the Toronto-based architecture and urban design firm, Baird Sampson Newart Architects. Our panelists are writer, director, and co-producer of Integral Man, Joseph Clement, Professor at U of T's John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design, a principal at Shim Sutcliffe Architects, and an integral architect of Integral House, Bridget Shim, and an eclectic composer, arranger, and keyboardist who had the opportunity to perform in the Integral House, Aaron Davis. So thank you once again for joining us today. Enjoy the film and the panel discussion that follows. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm George Beard. We've all been introduced, so I'm not going to uh, um, go through that again, uh, but I will, for those of you, well, you'll know Bridget uh, since she's in the film. This is, of course, the filmmaker, Joseph, and this is Aaron Davis, who's a, a musician, a pianist, who, um, though he doesn't appear in the film, at least not as far as I saw, um, uh, is a musician who had, did perform in Integral House. Um, I, th I had thought of asking each of the panelists to make a, an opening remark to kick this off, but given that Joseph made the film and Bridget's in the film, I'm actually going to revise my program slightly. But I will ask Aaron to say a few words about uh, uh, his experience of the house, and um, we'll take it from there. Okay. Um, I actually uh, have... <clears throat> a number of different ways uh, that I kind of relate to Integral House. As a child, I played in the ravines right behind it, went tobogganing at Trolley Park and explored all through there. Um, and uh, the, the way that I came to play at Integral House was through my long associate, uh, association as pianist with Misha Burger gosman and um, the wonderful singer that you hear uh, performing there and embracing Jim uh, near the end of his life. Uh, I, I played there, I guess, three times. Um, and um, uh, the, when I first went there, uh, Misha introduced me to Jim. And my father's a mathematician. I asked Jim if he p perhaps knew my dad, who, who taught at U of T and still is associated with it. And he said, yes, he was one of my professors. And so, um, uh, and also, by coincidence, he said, yes, and I used, to play, I used to play Mozart trios with your father. My father plays piano, and, and uh, 
so both of them shared a love of mathematics and, and music. Um, and it occurred to me, uh, uh, and I was talking about this with Bridget, uh, that there's a great sort of, uh, there's something, a mysterious connection between mathematics and music. And uh, I've been thinking about this uh, for a while, and I have a feeling that in the making of the uh, making of the house, in, in the sort of creative brainstorming that happened, there was there must have been some consideration of uh, of music and music musical ideas. And uh, in watching the film, it occurred to me that uh, one of the things that is common between music and uh, and mathematics is the juxtaposition. Uh, there's systems that at the same time have, at one level, things that are very orderly. And certainly Jim, in his work in, in terms of making calculus known to the people, uh, uh, the orderly side of his mind uh, found, I think he found beauty in the order that exists in mathematics and in music. But at the same time, at, at another level, there are things that are wildly unpredictable about both music and, and mathematics. And, and one ha to understand them, to live with them, to inhabit their worlds, one has to be comfortable with the idea that there are irrational numbers. And one has to be also comfortable with the idea that uh, music is essentially, uh, uh, is essentially an emotional thing and, does it, and defies uh, a lot of the, the bounds of order. Um, I, I believe that uh, other common elements that we can find in them are in mot motifs and motivic development, and that could even be said of the architecture, the the, the introduction and the uh, repurposing of different motifs throughout. And if you look at a very orderly composer like Bach, it's it seems like it's working like uh, according to a, a grand plan, and motifs are spun out in different keys and they interlock in a beautiful way. But then, at all times, there's the there's the danger that things are gonna, could potentially go off the tracks, and they do. Bach takes them, he pushes them off the tracks. Anyway, uh, there's probably a lot of different ways in yeah, which I these things. Just um, add one thing. The so I think Joseph did a wonderful job of capturing the very last concert that Jim had there, which was sort of his wake. Um, but the very first concert he had, he actually commissioned Vancouver composer Rodney Sharman. He had the St. Lawrence String Quartet, Shauna Ralston. This had been kind of planned out in his head a long time in advance. And Rodney Sharman did an amazing job. He actually visited the construction site several times. And the piece he did was quite remarkable because it actually captured this kind of um, unpredictability and this kind of calmness at the same time and fluctuated quite a bit. What happened was um, uh, there were violinists in the upper, like where the living room and the dining room were. They actually called to each other across the space. So it was almost like they were exploring the space through music and then eventually came together with the cellist who was in the main space, and then they kind of played together. So it was started off as a solo, a duet, uh, sort of like it, it was a kind of wonderful um, sort of musical exploration of the kind of scale and the um, uh, sort of experience of the space. And in a way, I felt that it was um, quite uh, a wonderful way to capture this the the very um, sort of opposite conditions that you're talking about in terms of uh, the music uh, the differences and uh, of of the way that music can be both irrational and emotional and rational at the same time. I should say that um, while I did know Jim Stewart, uh, unlike my fellow panelists, I did not know him intimately. Um, and, and I had not seen the film uh, before this afternoon myself. And ha though from the, the brief experience I did have of um, knowing him, I had already understood that Jim Stewart was a tough customer. Um, and uh, having your wake before you die <laughs> is certainly an evidence of a certain psychological toughness. But then, to actually make the program, the musical program for the wake, 
Richard Strauss's last songs. This is toughness of a very high order indeed. Um, I, in that regard, I, I, one of the things I hadn't realized until this afternoon was the way in which the film actually has a double subject. One subject of the film is, of course, the house, but the other subject is, of course, his process of dying. Mm -hmm. And I think I'd be interesting to have you say something. And you, I presume you knew he was dying at the time. Oh, you did not. Oh, no. well, all right. Well, I'll let you say it. I'm interested in knowing how you dealt with that, you know, double agenda for the film. Yeah, it was. Um, it was actually quite interesting um, how it came to be. We were actually we started this project, um, but it was five. It's five years in the making, and so about two and a half or three years into it was when uh, Jim actually got sick and broke his hip and uh, uh, they thought at first it was osteoporosis and it turned out to be multiple myeloma. Um, so when we had started the film, he was in, as far as everybody knew, in perfectly good health and condition. So um, it was certainly surprising, uh, to say the least. But also I think what was really interesting is how um, you address, one how one addresses the issue of death when confronted with it in a uh, in an unexpected manner, and you, you know, as a documentarian, you become very close to your subject. And, you know, death is a thing that is both very kind of, very big and also very small at the same time, because it's such an intense kind of subject. Um, and I, I said to Jim, he's a very uh, pragmatic individual, uh, so I w decided to be very pragmatic with Jim. I said, you know, you're, you're, if you're dying, what do you want to do about the film? He's like, well, what do you, what do you mean? We're going to keep, why would you stop now? And I said, well, okay, so you know it's going to be difficult. I'm going to be asking you a lot of very kind of um, forthright questions about it. And uh, he, was, he was very open to me. He said, look, I'm an atheist and I'm a scientist. And I, um, I'm a very pragmatic individual, and death for me is just, a, is just a matter of fact, like everything, like waking up every morning is a matter of fact. And so he was very kind of open to the entire thing, and so um, it was interesting to watch him um, proceed through the challenges of, of uh, dying with cancer. Um, and one really incredible afternoon morning, the scene where he's wearing the blue shirt where he's playing the violin, in the house and um, where he's showing us his violins. He actually hit his head that morning and up until that point had been very kind of a bit um, uh, um, kind of foggy and hazy and tired and he hit his head that day and he, he had totally changed his complete demeanor and his complete um, outward look on things and we just went for about seven or eight hours that day interviewing him and that's actually where a lot of our footage came from, and it was shortly after that that things really began to accelerate in his decline. So it was, I don't know if it was a, a happenstance, but it was a very interesting situation nonetheless. So, um, but it is very difficult to kind of confront those, that, that situation when obviously it wasn't what was expected going in. Thank you, Joseph. I think I'm gonna open it up to the floor now, and so I would ask you if there's anyone that has any questions they would like to put. Um, apparently we have mics. Um, so um, you can alert uh, the folks on standing on either on the aisle on either side of the seating to let them know, and um, you can address them to any one of the three panelists. Aha. Hello. Okay. Uh, this is for Joseph. Um, I have a question about the one shot I saw with inside the violin. Did you have to like sacrifice the violin, or did you put a, some sort we, of lipstick camera in there? We did. We tried many different things. We actually um, we looked inside of a violin, and then we looked inside of a cello, and realized that they're vi almost absolutely identical. We couldn't get a camera lens small enough to get inside of a violin, but we actually went to Heinel Violin. And Rick Heinel, who uh, runs the shop, said, you know, we've got a bunch of old student bodies, in the, like cello bodies in the back. Uh, and they just pulled one out and they reamed a big hole in the bottom of it, large enough for the camera lens to go in. And so um, it's an interesting story. One day we were looking at Jim's violins and I was holding it, looking at it, trying to figure out how we were going to shoot these violins. And the light came in through one F hole, which allowed me to see in through another F hole. And I looked and I was like, oh my God, the inside 
of the violin is, looks exactly like the inside of the concert hall inside of Integral House. And that was where this whole idea is like, oh, we, have to, we have to shoot the inside of this violin because the, it was so striking, the similarities between the two. Um, and so we, we, we had scope cameras and everything, but this, there wasn't a high enough quality resolution, so we ended up having to get a large body cello and then so we could get a, a good enough uh, image uh, with a camera, so. But that was all kind of a, a, kind of a happenstance, sort of, so. So, my question is to Bridget. Um, after Joseph saying the inside of the violin resembled the concert space in Integral House, uh, was that an intentional design on your part? Um, we didn't look inside a violin before we designed the space. Um, but I would say um, Jim said to us, straight lines are boring. Uh, the, the aspect of calculus uh, for him was actually vo volumetric curvilinear spaces. And so that's really what our part of our program or brief was to kind of be able to realize spaces like that in the house itself. And uh, so that's what we tried to do. And then given the situation in the ravine, we really wanted light to be a kind of active participant in the day-to-day -day experience of the space. And because we're so lucky to live in a latitude in Canada at 43 degrees latitude, every season is a very different light quality. Because of the verdant landscape ravine, you know, summer, winter, spring is actually quite different. And I think that, uh, uh, so we really wanted the experience of every season to be actually legible. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, Joseph's film did such a great job of really capturing the mood of each of the various seasons and the relationship between the kind of uh, exterior and interior. I think it's not accidental that Joseph was trained as a landscape architect before he became a filmmaker. And so this kind of reading of the landscape for me is one of the things that I really, um, is so palpable in whenever I see the film because I'm always reminded, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a ravine edge made physical. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, your, your experience uh, for in the house is you're seeing it from the inside looking out, but also the ravine is sort of pushing in. And I feel that the kind of um, sensibility of a landscape architect kind of grounds the whole experience in a really different way. It's not object fixated, but it's really about the kind of interaction with the ravine through every mm -hmm. season. That's hopefully what you kind of come away with or what I feel is sort of really captured in, in the film. Yeah, and I'll just uh, add one thing to that. Um, it was also, there was the decision to shoot the film in 35 millimeter because um, the quality of light is so important. The light is actually a, a character in the film um, because the way that you understand the volumetric aspects of the house are actually very different on time of day and time of year. Um, and when you watch the film, you'll see some shots are actually totally green. And it's because the light being reflected off the trees is actually making the interior of the house green. And then at the end, you can see in the winter how everything was so ne neutralized by that very stark white, uh, white light. And, um, and so it was very, very important for us that we were able to ca capture this relationship, not only to the physicality of the, of the ravine landscape, but also the interpretation of the space into in, in, in juxtaposition, I guess, with the landscape. Uh, but but as well. those flash, so part of it is that you get these little flashes, mm -hmm. and they're part of like holding the camera, mm -hmm. right? The, yeah, camera, the, the way that you're holding it and the fact that it's 35 millimeter, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is sort of, again, so much is shot digitally and so little is shot in mm -hmm. actual film now. So it was really special to kind of have that slightly, sort of slightly shaky, kind mm -hmm. of like handheld quality mm -hmm. to it, which yeah. I thought was really great. So there was someone there. Thank you so much. It was a really beautiful film and obviously a, um, a beautiful um, interaction of disciplines. So I, I kind of want to put a question to all of you um, about, I guess, how you disciplinarily crafted the narrative uh, in terms of building the house, in terms of building a film, in terms of building these narratives. Um, because I'm wondering about the... Um, about interpretation in all of us because there's so much 
of the quality of, of, um, of the house, of the film, of interpreting, um, I mean, within mathematics and within classical music, interpretation is so um, integral. So I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about how you took all these details that are so obviously important um, in, the, in the design and in, in the buildup of these images and how, how you approach the narrative for, for all the forms. And how, how much that has to do, I suppose, with, as you're saying, light as a character, as James is obviously a core character, um, how did you negotiate between all of these details for your narratives? You should probably go first, Bridget, okay. I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, well, I would say all of it is about relationships. Um, you know, uh, our relationship, Howard, so uh, Howard Sutcliffe is my partner and we worked on all of this together and in a way it's sort of our relationship to Jim, uh, our relationship to Joseph, Joseph's relationship to Jim, uh, to all the musicians and the entire musical community that he was so um, um, actively a supporter of. Um, so I just feel like everything sort of builds on top of each other and in a way, I mean, it's a kind of interesting as an architect, you think of architecture as so physical. We're working with concrete and stone and steel and things that are, you know, very um, sort of sort of lasting. And in the end, I would say celluloid has a kind of life that's actually quite different than architecture. And so, you know, there are new owners in the house, but I would say the kind of experience of the house as understood through the musical experiences and the kind of the, the musicians being in the space, you know, I would say Joseph was able to capture as another narrative that architecture sort of on its own is not quite capable of doing. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of interplay between the physical thing, which is so kind of robust and, and heavy, and, uh, and then the kind of celluloid, which is this so ephemeral, is a very interesting kind of interplay for me of the two. And to, to think that maybe celluloid has a kind of longer life mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> and maybe a kind of bigger audience than the kind of uh, the physical architectural artifact, you know, it's interesting to think about. Um, yeah, and I think too those relationships are quite interesting because it's, you're right, it is funny because this notion that like a building we think is so fixed in place, but you know, it doesn't take much because when the house was for sale, everybody's like, well, what's going to happen to the house? Who, what if they paint it or what if they carpet it or you know what I mean? And all these things that could possibly happen. And then the realization that it's this notion that all of a sudden like, wait, the film might actually have some more permanence than the architecture in a way. And I was like, well, that's really interesting. And then it became very important of, as a record and the relationship of this piece, because it's a very renowned, this house is, is internationally renowned as, as being one of the most important pieces of residential architecture, you know, built in North America in recent, in recent time. And that's according to uh, director of the Museum of Modern Art, Glenn Lowry. So, um, I mean, it's an important piece of architecture to this country and, for, and to this community. And, um, and so I think it is, it's interesting in that sense, the way that a film can kind of capture that relationship between Jim and the owner and the, the, the person who commissioned it and what was happening when he was alive and there. And I think that's a really important thing that we don't, you know, we might, we could lose, so. I think that you're, that's an excellent film and the film may actually have a positive impact on the future of the house because I think anyone who sees the film uh, it will help them to recognize uh, its worth and to participate in the experience of the house, and that might actually end up helping the preservation long term. Actually, I'm going to tell an architecture art joke as a little interlude in this uh, <laughs> conversation. It has, and it has, well, it, as with the commentary from Bridget and Joseph about the house versus the film, uh, Eb Seidler, a, another notable Toronto architect. Um, built a house for himself in a different Rosedale Ravine, actually not that far from Integral House, many years ago. The, um, um, and uh, while the house existed, uh, I don't know the circumstances of this taking place, but the, the, the house became the subject of a painting by the painter Peter Doig. Um, and anyway, time passes, the years go by, um, and two things happen. One, uh, the Zeidlers, having got to a certain age, decide to sell the house and move to an apartment. Um, 
Peter Doig's painting of the house goes on the resale market. Um, and Jane Zeidler told me this in a kind of ruefully jokey tone of voice. The house sold for $5 million. The Peter Doig painting sold for $10 million. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I'll look for another question from the floor. <laughs> yes. Are you, have you got a mic? Yes. Uh, it's, yes, here we go. I would like to bring it back to the question of the house as a musical instrument. So I wonder, Bridget, did Jim ask you to design it in a particular way that would make it you know, acoustically rich and, and work acoustically, considering you've got all these concrete surfaces and steel surfaces and so on? Did he make that a, you know, a, a, a mandate for you? And secondly, Aaron, I wonder if you would comment on what it's like as a musician to play within that space acoustically. So a really great question. Um, so Jim had an amazing ear. You know, you could tell from, you know, as a musician. Um, but he said uh, that if we consulted an acoustician from the beginning, they would want it to be a shoebox. And that he didn't want to live in a shoebox. And one of the really interesting things about this whole, the integral house itself, is that it, it's, a, it's a private house but it has a very public program. So it oscillates between these kind of, you know, days where it's, it is a public venue, but it's really in somebody's house, which is really how a lot of salons and musical events started off. And so, um, so what Jim said was, I actually don't want to consult an acoustician at the beginning. Uh, we also had to work within the envelope of the existing building that was there and all kinds of zoning issues. Um, but when we got us to a certain level uh, where the kind of basic programmatic elements were fixed, we actually built a really big wooden model, like really large, and we, um, asked two different acousticians to come to our studio and to look at the actual model and not to do any calculations, but as acousticians give us a sense as to A, do you think it's gonna work and B, how can we make it better? And so we listened very carefully, some of the material choices, the shaping of the inner balcony elevations, we're really um, listening to what their comments were and their feedback um, it wasn't until the very first concert that we actually knew whether it was a good space or not. And in the end, I think Jim you know, was so happy. And uh, I think the, you know, the sense of the acoustics when the audience is there is actually um, really, really uh, great. But we actually didn't really know until you know, there was actually a performance in the space. Yeah, as far as playing in that um, space, uh, it's... I think that one of the things that they've managed to do between uh, between Bridget and Howard and uh, and Jim is to create a space that is uh, uh, that facilitates the kind of evaporation of artifice. So uh, a lot of what we musicians wrestle with when we play in different idioms of music is the showbiz aspect of of music. And I think that uh, in all the times that I was there. Uh, uh, it's, it's kind of like Zen in the art of concert, uh, uh, you know, concert creation. Like the, the people who were the audience was particularly uh, particularly attentive, and there's kind of a mutual feedback loop that that goes back and forth between the audience and the uh, musicians. Uh, when you know somebody's listening closely, uh, it enables you to play things that you might not ordinarily. So for example, every note has a kind of a shape. You, you play a note on your instrument and it, it's sort of like a bloom of the note and then it decays. And so I, I can say that you know, the first time I played there was uh, a duet with um, Misha and me. We were playing a song called Miss Otis Regrets and we played it, we started it out totally differently from the way we would have. I went inside the piano with the sustained pedal on who was plucking and hammering the strings. She, she started singing into the piano and, and was getting all sorts of cool sounds. And, and it's a different way of playing. If you're playing inside the, you know, the Elma Combo or something like that, you'd be, you'd be, you'd be sort of hammering out the, the rhythm. You would be you know, trying to entertain the people to try to get them to stop talking or whatever. 
This is the exact opposite. This is more like, let's hear what this note sounds like. And it, it enables not only the communication of the musicians with each other, but the communication between uh, the musicians and, and the audience. It's like a kind of a, it's what music is supposed to be. The other thing I would just add to that is that um, in any composition, uh, and in any interpretation of composition, there is there are the notes, there's the way the song goes, and then there's the intention, uh, the intention of the musician in performing those notes. And I think that that proximity, there's no kind of barrier between the audience and the musician, uh, enables the idea of intentionality. You know, it enables, you can hear the, the singer as she inhales to approach a note. The, the, the violinist raises the up bow to strike it or the piano, you know, uh, th there are all these uh, things that precede and follow the making of music that are made clear. And so the whole process of music creation is much more uh, uh, vivid than it would be in uh, other musical spaces. Well, I just want to add to that. It's amazing. I, ne I was so struck by the first time seeing a concert in the house. You can literally hear, it's like kind of like listening to um, Gold, the Goldberg variations where you can hear Glenn Gould like humming and, or kind of breathing heavily and gasping. And, and you always kind of think when you listen to music, there's always this kind of disassociation between, in a way, the, the physicality of the performer and then the actual music itself. And when you're sitting literally from here to here, in front of a performer and in front of a quartet or even a larger arrangement, you really viscerally get that 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 relationship. And I was just I was totally blown away and I'd never really experienced that before. And I just that to this day strikes me so deeply as that that real um, closeness and the relationship between the audience and it's incredibly powerful. I would have to say, I mean, I was, we were so fortunate because we knew Jim. We got invited to almost all the concerts that happened there. Uh, contemporary dance, uh, Philip Glass, Steve Reich, uh, you know, great uh, Zumata. The, there was um, uh, the um, Aldenburg uh, uh, group. Uh, so you had uh, music and dance. You had uh, cello and vocal. You had, uh, so, so we saw so many different stagings in the space of where the musicians were, how they would enter the space, mm -hmm. where they chose to leave from. Uh, you know, I describe Rodney Sharman's initial piece. And so in a way, you design a space as an architect, and we did drawings showing layouts of chairs and you know different things. But in a way, to see how different musicians decided to stage and use the mm -hmm. space as a kind of backdrop for what they wanted to do was such an enriching experience. And to see it over this kind of multiple you know years and such different approaches to it was really really fascinating and uh, just the kind of ability for kind of one space to do all these uh, different things when it was not a generic space but actually quite specific so uh, so it was a really wonderful learning experience for us to kind of uh, see it in action um, in such different ways the one other experience that I had was of going there uh, um, Misha and a singer-songwriter and piano player named Royal Wood uh, and I were all kind of working on a, uh, a CD and I remember going there and sort of arranging some, uh, you know, doing some string arrangements there <clears throat> seated, you know, at the, at the piano with, with Royal and, and Misha and uh, I think that it would be a great place to not just perform but to write in, you know, as a solitary artist in that space, because it's, um, you know, the proximity to nature and the reverberance and, and everything would be very conducive to the free flow of, of ideas, I think. Anyone else? Yes, someone toward the back there? <clears throat> Um, 
you mentioned a little bit about it uh, in the early discussion, and that the film talked about how he was um, Jim was weighing the decision between selling the property or uh, setting it up into a be a foundation. And I was just wondering if uh, he shed any light at all about what kind of made him decide in the end to to sell it. I know it's you know the film mentions that it's uh, the new owners are keeping it uh, for the performance purposes, but I'm just curious what swayed him one way or the other. Well, I think um, what initially, I mean, his diagnosis from diagnosis to his death was actually quite a rapid uh, period of time. And setting up foundations is actually also a, a complex and lengthy thing to do. But also from a very practical and kind of legal standpoint, in order to have that house in any kind of public sort of um, exposure uh, would have required pretty substantial changes to the structure to meet fire code and regulations, which from what I understand would have um, really de destroyed the interior architecture of the house to begin chopping it up to put in fire door. Like, you can go from the fifth floor of that house to all the way down to the level of the swimming pool and there's really not a single door that you can, like the way it said, there are doors but they're integrated into the walls, into the paneling, everything is done so it's seem completely seamless. So, you know, if you're gonna begin to split the house up, for those for that purpose, it would really kind of be kind of antithetical to what what the house is. I think. Well, in a way, I would say again, it's this oscillation between public and private. So, if it's a house and you have 200 people for you know a nice concert in your living room, that's just what you do. Mm -hmm. um, whereas if it's actually a performance space, then there are exiting requirements and a whole bunch of other things. I just think Jim didn't have enough time. Mm -hmm. I just think you know it could have had a different outcome, but he just needed more time. Mm -hmm. And it was so quick. It was so unexpected. Jim was probably one of the healthiest people I knew. He did went for a walk every day for an hour. He was very, very disciplined. And so in a way, it was a, such a huge surprise to everyone. Mm -hmm. So unexpected. And so I think he kind of just, and so in a way, I would say the kind of, the proceeds from the house has actually gone to so many important groups that he really believed in. LGBT causes, um, the music department at the University of Toronto, architecture. So all of his interests were actually addressed in the kind of uh, way that the funds were actually uh, dispersed from the house, which I think was really what, what he wanted. But if he'd had, had more time, we're not sure what would have happened. Mm -hmm. And I just want to uh, add, uh, so when Jim passed away, he left um, a donation to the um, to the LGBT community, which was the single largest donation in the history of Canada, and uh, it will continue to be donating through the proceeds of the sales of his books, which will continue to go on after he has passed away. So, just in that one instance, and that's one of many different organizations or causes that Jim was supporting, and just in that one uh, 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 venue or avenue of donation was the most significant in the history of the country. So Jim um, in death really is really changing a lot of, um, benefiting a lot of aspects of the community. And the, actually the very, very first event, not the first concert, but the first event was actually for um, the LGBT community at the University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And he spoke to us about being a kind of young professor at McMaster and how hard it was. It was really tough. Mm -hmm. And I think he really wanted to kind of change that landscape for, for the future. Anyone else? I was curious to ask a personal question if um, in each of your respective crafts in this experience you've learned anything unexpected or surprising that you've taken with you beyond the project. Um, well, I guess, you know, this was my first film, so um, I certainly learned quite a bit <laughs> from doing this project. Um, but, I mean, it was interesting. I mean, being so close with Jim while he died, um, and I was there just a few hours before he died, actually, uh, you kind of really value <clears throat> a lot of uh, things in your life differently, I think. And I really, I had just had a friend who died also of cancer um, a year before and kind of had some regrets about not being... Um, around and kind of a bit hesitant about the process because cancer is 
a really unpleasant um, way to, to, to go. Um, and it was really a really important learning experience for me. And it, it really it changed my focus of my life and how I really viewed a lot of things um, and how you value things. And Jim, again, being so pragmatic, he would just tell me what it, I would ask him. I would have to ask him, you know, it's my job. I was like, what does it feel like to be dying? Like, what does it physically feel like? You know, and we would have these kinds of conversations. And that was a pretty life-changing experience, I'd have to say. Um, so I'd have to say for me, architecture is about life. That's kind of fundamental. Um, you know, the, the kind of, uh, we actually did a little book, book sort of partway through the public, the building of the house. And we actually listed every single uh, person that had worked on the house. So whether it was a kind of uh, excavation company and all the people that worked on it, the concrete company and everyone that worked on it. And there were kind of like at that stage of the process, so maybe sort of two and a half years into the kind of construction, about 250 people. Um, and in a way, it was kind of like a window into the um, amazing point in time in the Toronto construction industry because our entire city is built by people mostly that came as immigrants. Um, maybe their kids would do what the, the parents did, but maybe the, the third generation wouldn't do what the first or second generation did. And so you actually saw this kind of incredible cast of characters. You saw pieces of it there that there was to build a project uh, of any scale in the city, there's so many people's lives that you intersect with. Um, so there's the client, there's all the kind of, uh, you know, the, the engineers and all that, but then the kind of, the range of trades that we actually dealt with over the process of building the project is really an amazing snapshot in the kind of, um, uh, the way that our immigrant culture has actually realized much of our city. And I would say that's changing rapidly. It's a kind of, it was a moment, and I know, and if you were to try to build that house now, you'd be really, there would be struggles in figuring out who would actually do certain pieces and how we would actually get it done because we're at a different generational period of our construction industry. The issue of what, how we use computers for fabrication versus handmade things. So I would say that a kind of many levels, there are so many interesting lessons uh, that, that we were able to learn um, beyond the human relationships of the kind of client and the kind of that whole piece, which is so well captured. There's a whole kind of um, snapshot of the kind of moment of construction at this point in the life of Toronto. Do you want to respond? I don't, I don't have anything, I mean, you're both very involved in the uh, the project. I I would say it, it, the inspiration for me uh, comes partly from the way uh, Jim, uh, you know, uh, his life was is the legacy of the, the, what he left behind him, both in terms of physical um, physical space and in terms of the kind of uh, the you know you can't quantify it, you can't fix music or visual art in in time, but in a, in a sort of way, he uh, he left behind this sort of space, which Joseph has so eloquently uh, shown, that uh, uh, hopefully can uh, break down the artifice of show business and um, uh, instill uh, a creative artistic spirit. So you know, we owe a lot to uh, Jim, and he's sort of exemplary also in the way he exited. Uh, uh, he exited gracefully and and just as he lived his life. We probably have room for one or maybe two more questions if there is one. Yep, middle, middle toward the back. <clears throat> What is the future and possible, uh, the, the present and possible future of uh, the house in terms of its um, public use? Well, the current, the new owner of the house um, has, when they purchased the house, they really actually um, really respected Jim's original wishes and original vision for the for the house. And 
They plan on, I actually haven't been, but they plan on, and I've, I've heard and have had actual events at the house, and when they purchased the house, they purchased all of the contents of the house as well, um, because they wanted to keep it as almost as an entire record. So they are really committed um, to keeping the house to um, its original, and in fact, there were some modifications made by the estate after Jim passed away. Um, and from um, what he said to me, he wanted to actually reverse those to the original intent of the architect. So I think they're very committed to keeping the house not only as a piece of architecture, but programmatically um, very close to what Jim's um, original intent and vision for the house was. So, which is really an amazing thing because that house without that capacity or aspect is really, you know, a half of its, you know, purpose in life. So it's really great that they are going to. Uh, and so far have said they were committed to doing that, so. There was someone in the, in the middle uh, also who had a question. Oh, you've got the mic, yep. Yeah, this one's uh, for Joseph. Uh, congratulations, it was a great film, and uh, I'm amazed to hear it's your first. What's the second film gonna be? Um, <laughs> well, uh, thank you. I'm actually um, working on a film now about um, the role of landscape architecture, um, and its uh, role basically in future uh, development in, of society and kind of answering some of the larger questions um, that we're going to be confronting about depopulation and repopulation due to climate change, but then also how do we move forward from where we are now and as landscape architecture kind of being the core practice and philosophy theory of, of the kind of forward momentum. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up with a, a little comment on um, uh, the kind of architecture world in which this film was made. As I said uh, already at the beginning of my remarks, I hadn't seen the film before, um, and I was taken aback. The first voice, voice you hear voice over in the film, at the very beginning of the film, is a voice I recognized immediately as that of Larry Richards, who is, was my predecessor as Dean of the Architecture Faculty at the University of Toronto. Um, and Larry's voice, he's not in the film, but his voice comes back two or three times uh, uh, as it unfolds. Uh, then, then for those of you that, uh, whose ears can pick up intonations, the most English voice you hear in the voiceover is that of Kenneth Frampton, who's, um, one of the most senior uh, architectural historians and critics uh, who teaches at Columbia University. Um, and then the most American voice you hear, sort of slightly slangy, uh, is Glenn Lowry, who is the director of the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So there's a, it, it's a kind of in-group soundtrack this movie has. Uh, you, those people are all listed at the end, but it's certainly evocative to hear their voices as they go by. So we're at, we're, we're at the end of our time for this afternoon. So I would like to thank you all for coming to the screening and for staying for the discussion, and in particular to thank uh, Aaron, Bridget, and Joseph for participating in the panel here this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.